Hi, I'm Kelly Sue DeConnick, and I am going to read for you Julie Andrews Edwards, The Last of the Really Great Wang Doodles, the first chapter, uh, which was a book I loved when I was in the fourth grade. All right, you ready? Part one, challenge. It was a crisp, sunny October afternoon, and Benjamin Thomas and Melinda Potter were visiting the Bramblewood Zoo. They hadn't particularly wanted to visit the zoo, but Mrs. Potter had been very firm about it. Daddy's been working extremely hard, she'd said, and I think he needs an afternoon of peace and quiet. Here's some money. I suggest you go to the zoo. There was no arguing with Mrs. Potter in this mood, so the three children had dutifully taken the bus from the stop at the corner of their street and had ridden through the pretty university town of Bramblewood as far as the zoo. Although it was the end of October and very cold, the sun was shining brightly from an unusually clear sky. Only a few clouds on the horizon gave a hint of possible rain. Late autumn leaves blew along the pavement and rolled in through the main gates of the zoo as if inviting the children to follow. On this lovely Sunday, the place was crowded with visitors and there were popcorn sellers, balloon vendors, and a man pushing a yellow cart piled high with toys. Children yelled happily as they scampered along the rides and to the animal cages. In spite of their early reluctance to venture out, Benjamin, Thomas, and Lindy had to admit, now that they were there, that the zoo didn't seem like a bad place to visit at all. I want to see the tigers, Tom announced. I want to see the donkeys and the ducks, countered Lindy. Donkeys and ducks, Tom scoffed. Anyone can see a donkey or a duck and you don't have to go to the zoo for it. That's just a waste of time. I know, I know. Lindy replied, I just feel like seeing a donkey and a duck today. I don't know why. Oh, look, if we're going to spend the afternoon trailing around looking at animals like that, well, we're not, Ben interrupted firmly. He was used to his younger brother and sister squabbling with each other. We're going to see the elephants first because the, I'm the oldest and I'm in charge. Come on. The children visited the elephants and then the lions and the tigers. They slowly moved on to see the llamas and the leopards and the rhinos and the reindeer, crocodiles and hippopotamuses and brown bears and polar bears. They watched the performing seals and Lindy saw three ducks and 12 penguins, which made her very happy. Tom suggested that they visit the aquarium. They were wandering through the dim corridors whose only light came from the many illuminated tanks in which turtles, sharks, eels, and other underwater creatures were to be seen. It was gloomy and damp inside. Lindy was very glad when Ben chose to go to the reptile house, but she clung tightly to his hand as he gazed at the cobras and rattlesnakes and a giant python. I'd love one of those for a pet, Tom said enthusiastically. Ugh, I think they're gross, really gross, Lindy exclaimed. You just say that because you're scared of them. No, I don't. They're not my favorite things, but I'm not scared. Then why are you sucking your thumb? I like the taste. Cut it out, you two, said Ben. What shall we do next? Lindy announced that she was tired and cold and extremely hungry. The children bought a bag of delicious, sticky-looking donuts and three cups of hot, sugary chocolate. Carefully, they carried the steaming mugs to a bench that caught the late afternoon sunshine and which was close to a fenced yard containing two large, disdainful-looking giraffes. Lindy had no sooner sat down than one of the giraffes spotted the donut she had in her hand and immediately undulated toward her on spindly legs, looking as though his knobby knees would buckle beneath him at any moment. The animal lifted his long neck over the wire netting and brought his face to within a couple inches of Lindy's, just as she was about to take a large mouthful of her donut. The giraffe and the children gazed at each other with serious con concentration for a moment. Then Lindy said solemnly, no, and moved herself and her donut farther along the bench and out of the giraffe's way. That's a really extraordinary animal, mused Ben as he watched. Imagine being born with a long neck like that. Imagine being able to reach the top of trees quite easily. I'd like that, said Tom. You could see the world from up there. I like giraffes a lot, Lindy spoke with her mouth full. If you could have any animal out of the zoo, which one would you like to take home? Ben suddenly asked. Oh, the, the python, Tom spoke without hesitation. Gross, said Lindy. I'd have a penguin. What would you have, Ben? Hmm, I don't know. Ben thought about it as he sipped his hot chocolate. 
I take something unusual, an orangutan, perhaps, or an anteater, maybe a gorilla. You'll excuse my butting in, said a voice immediately behind the children. But if you're looking for something really unusual, have you ever considered a wangdoodle? The children spun around. Sitting on the grass behind them, knees drawn up almost to his chin, was a small man. He was holding a rolled umbrella made of clear plastic. I, I beg your pardon, sir. Did you say something? Yes, I did. I said, have you considered a wangdoodle? The little man got up slowly. He had a round, cheerful face with bright blue sparkling eyes and a few hairs still growing out of his balding head were long and gray and flying in all directions. He wore an old brown sports jacket and a blue checked shirt with a purple yellow spotted scarf tied in a casual bow. He had shabby brown trousers on and old but highly polished shoes. Ben said, e excuse me, I don't think I've ever heard of a wangdoodle, sir. The remarkable looking man smiled, leaned on his umbrella, crossed one small foot over the other. Oh, that's not surprising. It's an extremely rare creature. In fact, I believe there's only one left in the whole world. What does it look like? Tom asked. Well, now I've not actually seen a wangdoodle myself, countered the stranger, although I do hope to see one one day. Then how do you know about it? Lindy wanted to know. Ah, oh, that's a long, complicated story, he replied. Here we are chatting away, and I don't even know your names. Tom tugged at Ben's sleeve. He was suspicious of the stranger, and he wanted to warn Ben that they should be leaving immediately and heading for home. But Lindy was already cheerfully giving out information. My name is Melinda Potter. Everybody calls me Lindy. How old are you, Lindy? I shall be eight on December 3rd. Which means she's seven, growled Tom. Ah, but of course, the stranger turned to him. And how old are you, young man? Ten. My name is Thomas Potter. And I'm Benjamin Potter, Ben offered. I'm 13. How about you? What's your name? Tom wanted to know. The stranger placed a hand on his forehead. Goodness me, what is my name? I seem to have, it seems to have escaped me for a moment. Lindy giggled. Tom nudged Ben hard and jerked his head as though to say, let's get out of here. But it's really of no importance, continued the man. What is important is that this is a most pleasant afternoon, and if I am not mistaken, it is only two days before Halloween, is it not? Lindy gave a little hop of excitement. Do you know what I'm going to be when we go trick-or-treating, she asked. Let me see if I can guess, he looked thoughtfully. Snow White, or possibly Cinderella. No, I'm going to be a lion, she said proudly. And a very ferocious one, I'm sure you'll be. What about you, Thomas? What are you going to be? I'm going to be the hunchback of Notre Dame. And you, Benjamin? I haven't decided yet. I don't know whether to be Dracula or Frankenstein. Well, I just hope I don't bump into any of you in the dark. I think I would be very scared. Maybe I'll change my mind and go as a wangdoodle, Lindy said brightly. The little man chuckled. What a good idea. You know, I, I don't think there is such an animal, Tom blurted out. Ben actually thought so too, but he was too polite to say so. Oh, I assure you that the wangdoodle exists, said the man. Look it up in your dictionary when you get home. What does it look like? asked Lindy. It's sort of hard to describe. It's a little like a moose or a horse, perhaps, but with fantastic horns, and I, I believe it has rather short legs. Where does it live? inquired Tom. Oh, far, far away, which is a good thing, for if it were here, it would be in a cage like all these other poor animals. I do so hate to see things in cages, don't you? And why do you come to the zoo if you don't like it? asked Lindy with her usual candor. I come to study the animals. I'd prefer to study them in their natural environs, environments, but I just haven't got the time. Ben suddenly remembered to look at his watch. Oh, gosh, we're late. Y you'll have to excuse us, sir, but we have to go now or we'll miss our bus. The little man took out a large watch from his pocket. Oh, yes, it is late, he said, and we'd better hurry because it is going to rain. He unfurled his umbrella with a flourish and opened it over his head. Large yellow butterflies were painted all over the clear plastic. 
Allow me to escort you, he said, and walked briskly towards the front gate of the zoo. Lindy fell into step beside him. I love your umbrella, she said admiringly. I bought it because it's cheery and it makes people look up. Have you noticed how nobody ever looks up? The man's voice was suddenly irritable. Nobody looks at chimneys or trees against the sky or tops of buildings. Everybody just looks down at the pavement or their shoes. The whole world could pass by them and people wouldn't notice. Ben and Tom discovered that they were looking at the pavement as he spoke. As he spoke, quickly they lifted their heads to the sky, only to get wet faces, for it was beginning to rain. They also bumped straight into Lindy and her escort, who had come to a sudden halt. This is where the bus stops, isn't it? asked the stranger. Ah, here comes one now. Very good timing, that. I hate to waste time, don't you? Visitors from the zoo were running for the bus for, or for their cars. Umbrellas seemed to be popping up everywhere. People who didn't have umbrellas were scurrying by with newspapers on their heads or their coats buttoned up tight. You see what I mean, said the man. None of them ever look up, ever. He helped the children onto the bus. It has been a great pleasure meeting you all. A most happy afternoon. He waved a red handkerchief as the bus pulled away from the curb. Goodbye, goodbye, he called after them. There was a sudden terrifying sound of rubber tires skidding to a stop and the blaring sound of a car horn. Ben, Tom, and Lindy quickly took, turned around in their seats and looked out the back window of the bus. The little man was standing in the middle of the street, apologizing to a taxi driver who had nearly run him down. I bet he was looking up, grinned Ben. The bus turned a corner and the scene disappeared from their view. And if you want to see if uh, Lindy, Ben, and Tom see the uh, stranger again, then you'll need to pick up The Last of the Really Great Wang Doodles. And this is actually by Julie Andrews, Julie Andrews, who used her married name, Edwards. <laughs>